What is up, YouTube? Before we get into today's episode, I just have some brief housekeeping. Some folks have been asking me if this podcast is available on their favorite podcast app, and the answer is yes. Uh, the audio version of this podcast is available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, and pretty much everywhere else. Um, you can either find a link to your preferred platform on berniesbootlegs.com, or you can just search Bernie's Bootlegs inside of your podcast app, and uh, you'll find it. And uh, it would also really help out the show if you were to follow or subscribe to the podcast on your preferred platform, and if you gave it a uh, five-star rating wherever you happen to find it. And um, also, let me know in the comments below if you guys care about the video of the podcast, or if you'd be cool with just an audio-only version. Um, so definitely let me know in the comments below if the video is important to you. And uh, I think it's about it. Thanks, and uh, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Bernie's Bootlegs Podcast, where we explore the stories of successful musicians and share their perspectives on how to be a professional artist in a digital age. I'm your host, Kenny McCabe, and let's get into the show. How's it going, everybody? Today, I'm bringing you my conversation with pianist and composer Glenn Zaleski. We discuss his early musical history, his introduction to jazz, moving to New York City, his process for assimilating new information, how he composes, his advice for younger musicians, and much more. You can find Glenn on his website at glennzaleski.com and also on Instagram at glennzaleski824. And so without further ado, I bring you my conversation with Glenn Zaleski. All right, guys, I'm here with Glenn Zaleski. Glenn, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. How are you, man? We've been dealing with some some technical difficulties, but uh, our, our technological overlords willing... Uh, we are we are here now and and set up and ready to go. So, um, how are you? Uh, I'm good. Yeah, I've I've uh, I've been pretty busy. I, I was I was in Germany last week. Uh, I'm gonna go to California next week, and then to Europe to, to Europe the week after that, um, and then out to the West Coast again. Uh, so yeah, I have a pretty busy schedule till the end of the year. Yeah, man. Yeah. Uh, good. Who were you in Germany with? I was in Germany with the drummer Marika Wiening. Uh, she uh, has a quintet, great quintet, and we played for about ten days across Germany. That's awesome. Um, and she she just put out a record. Um, actually, I, I believe it just is coming out now on Greenleaf. So we've been touring for that record. Although I actually was I was scheduled to be on the record, but about a maybe two weeks before the session, I got in a bike accident and broke my elbow. Oh no. And uh, so I had to uh, bail on the recording. Uh, fortunately, Dan Tepper was around and he, he could do the the recording. And also, fortunately, uh, Marika still calls me to play in the band, even though I couldn't make the session. So, Yeah, it must be pretty, uh, pretty strange or difficult to play piano with a broken elbow, I would imagine. Yeah, it was, it was, a, um, it was an interesting and kind of stressful time. Uh, yeah, it happened. The, the amount of things that I had to bail on was was pretty pretty intense. Um, yeah, it was a it was a tough it was a tough month. Uh, yeah, I, and I did I did sit in on a few gigs with just my left hand. Um, and actually, one one big disappointment was I was supposed to have a a trio gig in Spain. Uh, it was my own trio with Craig Weinrib and Desron Douglas, and uh, it was really exciting because we, you know, it was a gig at a festival in Vigo, and um, I had to I had to bail. I just couldn't do it because I, I had a broken hand, um, and it was you know it was on this weekend the the headlining acts of the festival were the Glenn Zaleski Trio and the Kurt Rosenwinkel Kaipi Band. Wow! It was like a tremendous a tremendous thing. <laughs> Uh, and just to get Craig and Desron together is really difficult. And this finally worked out. And then I broke my elbow and couldn't do it. But I actually flew out to Vigo anyways with the guys. And we, we were supposed, we were scheduled to do a master class. So I, I went and I, I did the master class. We all did it together. And I just played with my left hand. <laughs> it actually went pretty well. And it was a really good learning experience. And I probably shouldn't have waited to break my right hand before I spent so much time thinking about my left but whatever <laughs> whatever it takes 
Absolutely. And so one of the main configurations that people will see you in these days is the Stranahan Zaleski Rosado trio. Uh, obviously yeah. with uh, Colin Stranahan and uh, Rick Rosado. So maybe you can say a few words about how you met those guys and the musical relationship that you've developed with uh, those two gentlemen. Yeah, yeah, gladly. Um, Colin and I met at the Brubeck Institute in Stockton, California. We were 18, 17, 18 years old. And we spent a year together out there. And um, yeah, we became very close. Uh, we, so we've been, been friends for years. I mean, out there in, in California at the Brubeck Institute, you you know, you really live with the people that you're in, 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 in school with. So we spent a lot of time together and became very close. And that continues to this day. And Rick, when I went to the new school, Rick was one of the first people I met. Uh, we were roommates in a, a new school dorm, but we didn't know each other. Uh, it was just, I guess, serendipity. So I moved into a dorm in the financial district of Manhattan and uh, I get there and I meet my roommate and he's like, I'm Rick. I, I play bass. I'm going to the, the new school. And I said, Oh, cool. You play bass. That's, and then we, we played a tune and uh, it was pretty overwhelming how, <laughs> how great it was right, right away. And uh, yeah, we became very close friends and we lived in an apartment together in Brooklyn for a year after that. Um, and so that's how we all met. And then I, I kind of introduced Rick and Colin. Uh, Rick had uh, a concert series in Montreal at Upstairs. And uh, he was invited to put a few groups together. And um, one of the bands he wanted to play, Trio. So he asked me, and uh, I recommended Colin. And everything just went really great. We had a really amazing weekend playing up in montreal and we made our first record shortly after that right on what year was that i think those gigs were in 2010 and then our first record was 2011 wow so we were very a, yeah it's been a while young. yeah it's been a while that first record yeah we were we were very young i i had not done a lot of trio playing at that time so i um Actually, I mean, none of us had. <laughs> it was, it was, it was new. I think at that time, Colin probably had the most. He, he already had a few records out on the record label Capri. He maybe had the most professional experience. Um, but we were all really figuring it out. Uh, but we we stuck together and really grown together. And, and there's, I, I think that we all hear similarly and and um, have the same ideas about what what we want to do with music and uh we all we like to write for the band and we like to write for each other i'm very comfortable writing anything for rick and colin to play sometimes when you write original music you you write certain things for certain people and um you know you know some people do better with certain things than others but with rick and colin i i really think i can write anything and i know that they would just be open and amazing and make it something that I could have never imagined. Um, so it's very exciting. Yeah, man. And also just playing tunes, also just, just not even that, just, just playing tunes, just, uh, you know, getting together and, you know, playing monk tunes or standards. I mean, not that we do that very often at, at the moment, but even on gigs, just calling tunes and, 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 and blowing is, is, uh, yeah, there's a lot of simpatico there. Absolutely. And uh, I think that's super beautiful just to have that sort of a uh, musical connection that always results in an amazing experience for both the musicians and also the audience. Because I think that you can uh, you can tell if, if uh, certain people, you know, if, if they play well together for, for lack of a of a better term. So uh, you guys have a new record out uh, that just came out in August. Uh, what's it mm -hmm. called and uh, what's what's on it and and all that sort of stuff. Oh yeah, so here I'll hold up a copy so everyone can see it. This is it. This is what the CD looks like. In, in case you forgot what a CD looks like, uh, they're a little obsolete. But uh, yeah, we we um, we recorded it last year at the Standard, uh, and we played. Uh, we had two nights at the Standard. We recorded 
some stuff from our older albums and, and some newer tunes. And uh, yeah, it was just a really wonderful week and everything was captured really well. Um, and that that's the album. It's a very, our, our first two albums are a little contained. They're, they're in a studio and we're a little bit fresher as a trio, but th- this record is, we're, we're really opening up and we're really familiar with the material and, 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 and stretching. Um, yeah, it's, I'm really proud of the experience and really proud of the, the, the documentation. Uh, I think it's, it was a strong moment for, for us and uh, it, it really, yeah, it feels like you're there in the room, you know, listening and, uh, yeah, we're, we're proud of it. Right on, man. And so let's back up a little bit. Um, I would love to discuss uh, kind of where you grew up and what your early musical history was in terms of your family and stuff like that and how you got started playing the piano. Sure. Um, I'm from Massachusetts. I'm from central Massachusetts. I grew up in a town near Worcester. The town is called Boylston. And uh, I was playing the piano since I was seven years old. Uh, my brother is a few years older than me, and he started playing the clarinet and eventually the saxophone. And uh, he was doing really well. Uh, he was a very, I mean, he's a professional sax, he's a professional musician now, but when we were kids, he was really great right away. And he was, you know, doing well and playing in concerts. And I, I, I think I, you know, I mean, I, I looked up to him and I, I wanted to be able to, to play with him. And I always liked the piano. So I basically, from that age, I, I decided I wanted to play piano. And parents got me a keyboard. And um, pretty sure the, the first piano that they got me was a Fender Rhodes. Actually, I, I had a Fender Rhodes when I was maybe nine years old. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I uh, started off playing you know, pretty traditional piano lessons. It wasn't like classical music. It was just, you know, like learning to read and play piano. And, and I got into jazz pretty early. There, there was a, a jazz band in my elementary school uh, when I was in the fourth grade. And my brother had already been through that jazz band. And, and at that time he was playing saxophone and he was doing great. He was like, you know, a great soloist and kind of a star. And uh, I really really looked up to him uh and then yeah so i, I got into to jazz at a very young age you know in, in that context um and i think the when i was in eighth grade i went to go see a, a concert i went to go see the dave Brubeck quartet in worcester massachusetts and uh yeah i was really blown away i really really loved it and that was when i i I think I really got serious about wanting to to play jazz. Uh, once I saw some a, a really great performer really doing it, and I had an idea of what the music could be and, and the power it could have. So then I started taking lessons with a, a local, with, with a, a really great pianist uh, named Dick Odgren, who was the Worcester, Massachusetts uh, kind of uh, guru of jazz piano. And I started taking lessons from him, and he just kind of showed me everything that I needed to know uh, about learning tunes and playing tunes and that kind of, he was really into repertoire. He got me learning it's just quantity of standards from a very young age. And then, then I started playing gigs around town from a very young age like w- w- with my brother. We would play at all sorts of places, uh, country clubs and restaurants, and coffee shops. And also older musicians, too. My, my, my teacher, Dick Odgren, would recommend me for some gigs with older musicians. So I had a lot of professional experience from, from a young age, from early teenage years. What do you think uh, about the piano drew you to it as opposed to, uh, you know, maybe a wind instrument? Did you want to just play something that was completely different from your brother? Or how did that, uh, that arise? I don't know. I think... Yeah, I, I can't really say. I mean, I, I think I always liked the piano. I do remember a, a brief conversation once, you know, once school band started, there wasn't a slot for piano in the school band. In the jazz band there was, but not the concert band. You know, there was no piano chair. 
So I remember briefly thinking I wanted to play trumpet, but uh, I was kind of advised that if I started playing trumpet, it might interfere with uh, my piano playing. So I don't know whoever advised that. My, my parents or the band director. Is, so, so I ended up not playing trumpet, and, and in the school band, I played drums. They said, if you want to be in the band and play something that will be more related to piano, you should play drums. Uh, so I, I ended up playing drums in the concert band all, all through high school. Mallet percussion and timpani and, and uh, snare drum. I guess that was kind of good advice, actually. Hmm. Um, yeah, and I mean, man, everybody knows that your trumpet embouchure will mess up your piano embouchure. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, at least good advice in the sense of thinking about, I don't know, rhythm and I don't know. So the trumpet thing, that was not really anything. I mean, that was just me being eight years old and saying, I want to play trumpet. Uh, but piano, I don't know. I, 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 I just naturally gravitated towards it. I don't really remember even thinking about it. It wasn't a conscious decision. It was just like a natural gravitation. Kind of on a bigger picture level was music, ever since you started playing it, was that always kind of a singular focus? Did your parents push you in that direction or was it? entirely self-motivated were you ever interested strongly in any other things or was that kind of always what you felt that you were going to do oh i i, I always knew i wanted to do it i was pretty crazy about it uh, especially when i started playing i started playing jazz music i mean when i when i went to that concert and i started seeing uh my teacher dick Ogren, and i uh i was pretty crazy about it i i yeah, I, I practiced a lot on my own volition. I was my parents never forced me to practice. My parents were more likely to ask me to stop practicing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wasn't always good about. I didn't have much interest in in practicing classical music. I had a, a classical teacher, and I wasn't always good about practicing that. But I was really interested in learning tunes and figuring out my own stuff. I, I transcribed a lot of tunes, and I. Uh, listened to a lot of records and uh, yeah I think I, I, don't, I don't know why I just really liked it and it also it lined up because it, it was I, I had a genuine personal interest and also it was kind of my my work I mean I had you know like if I was going to go play a gig with so and so at this country club I needed to be sure I could play uh, in a mellow tone and two different keys and I had to play then and this singer likes to play they can't take that away from me in C and this singer likes to play when you're smiling in A flat you know what I mean I, I had like very practical uh reasons to, to to learn this stuff but also I had a very uh genuine personal interest so I feel like I'm lucky that I was able to find what I wanted to do I, I just kind of fell into it from a very young age it wasn't a very conscious thing um everything lined up pretty early. Yeah, man. And I think that that is, uh, unfortunately, very, very uncommon for the, the thing that you are most interested in to also be something that you can make a living at or something that uh, you enjoy and that you're and that you're good at. So not, not all the time that those things align. So I think that that is, uh, is a recipe for success. Yeah, every I'm, I'm very, very fortunate. I mean, in Worcester, Massachusetts, when I was uh, growing up, there was a a good, a good jazz scene. I mean, there was there was jazz clubs. There was regular concerts. I used to go hear my teacher Dick Odgren and and this a great trumpet player named Emil Haddad. They had a duo. They play once or twice a week. There was a Worcester big band that I used to play in every week. The Worcester Jazz Orchestra. Um, I had a lot of a lot of gigs. I could hear a lot of music. I wasn't far from Boston, so I could go hear some shows. My parents would take me to the Regatta Bar or Scholars sometimes. Um, it was a very vibrant scene and I was very lucky to, to be a part of it. Uh, yeah. Actually, the question of making a living never even, I never even really thought about it because I was kind of working. I mean, as, as a kid, I, I had these little gigs kind of regularly and, um, it seemed very natural to, to be a professional musician. I think that's uh, amazing. Uh, that's, it's amazing and very yeah. rare. Yeah, I, I don't know if that work is still around in, in Worcester. I, I, I don't know. I mean, the things that I used to do, the the restaurant and, and, and bars and country clubs, and I don't know if those places have pianos anymore or have jazz music. 
I mean, I used to play every week in a Italian restaurant called Cafe Amore. I used to play there with my brother. And then when he went to college, I, they became solo piano gigs. And, you know, we, we, there was a nice grand piano there and we would just play duo. And there was a lot of people in the audience and they would request tunes. You know, people wanted to hear, I've got you under my skin or you make me feel so young or fly me to the moon. I mean, like, like people knew standards and they, they would recognize standards that we played. And I, I hope that that still exists. Uh, I, I hope it does. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think I'm, it does somewhere. I mean, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure uh, someone in the comments will, will chime in. Yeah. You know, but, uh, uh, yeah. So you end up going to the Brubeck Institute after high school. Tell us a little bit about that, who your mentors were there and, uh, kind of maybe what your daily routine was like in terms of practicing and, and playing and just in general what you were up to. Oh, yeah, it was a really incredible time. Uh, it was really exciting for me. Also, you know, as as a big, I mean, Dave Brubeck was the, my my favorite pianist. I was I was obsessed with Dave ever since I saw that concert when I was in eighth grade. I I, I used to buy LPs on eBay that weren't released on CD yet, and I learned his entire repertoire and. and I, I was really crazy about him. So to go to the Brubeck Institute was just such an amazing, <laughs> it, it was, it was really a dream come true. And, um, and, w and when I got there, it was just overwhelming to play with that quintet of, of musicians because the level was so high. I had never, ever played with musicians at that, that level who, who were my age. It, it was really overwhelming. I felt like I had a lot of, catching up to do actually just to, to really pull my weight with, with, with those musicians um so when i was there it was a very loose schedule academically there was not a lot of academic responsibility not a lot of classwork um and i i really practiced a lot i, I mean i would practice every day for hours and hours i would just go into the practice room and they had a nice piano and yeah for hours a day, I don't know, six to eight hours. It was really crazy, actually. And I'd practice all sorts of stuff. I would transcribe stuff. I would write music. I would practice classical music. At that time, I started to be interested in classical music, and I, I practiced a lot of classical music. Um, I learned tunes that I felt I needed to knew, know. Um, yeah, it was really an amazing time. And then, of course, with the musicians I was there with, um, we would rehearse pretty regularly and play each other's music. Um, it's an amazing experience. My teacher there was an amazing pianist named Joe Gilman. But man, she, yeah, Joe is one of the best pianists in the world. And I was really lucky to have him kind of guide me and suggest things to, to work on and musicians to check out. Um, but I was also very self motivated. I, I knew what I, what I liked and, and I just went towards it. And, and while I was there, I had all the time in the world to, to do so. Definitely, man. I think that's perhaps one underrated aspect of college. And this is something that comes up over and over and over again, which is that there's no place like being in a conservatory or in music school. Uh, there's no other place where you have as much free time, hopefully, to be able to to practice and, and, and do that sort of stuff. Because as I'm sure you know, and everybody watching knows, as you get older, your your responsibilities increase. Mm -hmm. And so there's no time really like college where you can be as free to to, sh to be in, in the shed and, and doing everything that uh, you need to do in order to be able to grow. And so I think that that, that is uh, highly underrated. I think it's essential. I think really... Uh, yeah, you, you need to, I think students need to have, yeah, time to practice, a lot of time to practice, uh, as much time as they, as they want. Um, and while I was there, I never had to compete for a practice room or anything. I, it's basically 24 hours a day. I could just go there and play a nice piano whenever I felt like, and I could rehearse with the guys whenever. Yeah, it's very, it's very important to have that free time. Definitely. And so you do the two years at the Brubeck Institute and then tell us what the next step is for you. I believe you moved to New York after that to finish school. Is that correct? Yeah. Then I went to the new school to finish. I, I had two years at the new school. Um, I actually never really intended on moving to New York. I thought I was going to go to Boston where my brother was. 
and I, I was going to go to NEC. Um, but then I ended up going to new school. I mean, it was just actually a, frankly, it was a financial decision. It was just a better, better deal from the new school. And, you know, the stuff's very expensive. So I just figured, well, I'll, I'll go to New York. That sounds great. And I had friends there already who were in the Budak Institute previously. And, uh, and I'm, I'm really glad I did that because I had an amazing time at new school. And I met so many people that I, that I still play with now. And, and I learned so much being in New York, and studying with great musicians and hearing so much great music. It was, it was really something. Absolutely. And so once you, uh, once you, uh, finished school, uh, what made you decide to remain in New York? Was it just the, the fact that the scene was so strong? Was it partly the, the relationships that you had developed while you were there at the new school, I would imagine, is, is a part of it? Um, why did you stay in New York as opposed to uh, doing your original plan of going to Boston? Well, after being in New York and seeing it and feeling it for myself, I, I definitely couldn't have moved it. M moving out at that time, I felt would have been a backward step, you know, I at, at, at that time, after two years at new school, I, I felt like I, I had a vision for what I could do, how I could become involved. I still felt like I needed more time. And then, then I went to graduate school for two years. So, um, But I, I saw myself in New York and I, I wanted to, to be a part of it. Uh, I, I didn't see that before I moved to New York. I didn't think it was necessary to be in New York, but then when I was there, it was, uh, yeah, I, I couldn't have left. It was just, I, I, I really, I really love it here. Uh, yeah, man. It's it, just in terms of uh, the scene and, and the level of musicianship, I don't think it's, uh, it's, it's beatable. I don't even think that there's a, a close second, honestly, but, um, one of the main concerns, obviously, for people who go to school for music and then subsequently graduate is how to make a living as a musician, because yeah. you're going from being in school and, uh, you know, having uh, a dorm or whatever. And in many cases, like having your parents like support you partially or like supporting yourself through loans or whatever the case is. Mm -hmm. But then you have to go out into the real world. And uh, oftentimes it's it's very, very difficult to make that transition. So how did that look for you? And um were you able to support yourself right away or did it take time? No, I, I could support myself right away. I mean, while, while I was in school, my parents were, were paying my, my rent, um, which is really great. Uh, and we never really talked about it. Just when I finished graduate school, uh, I just started paying those bills myself. Um, and I, I had a, I was lucky. I had a really interesting job when I first finished, uh, I went to graduate school at NYU. So I was four years in school in New York before I started, you know, really taking care of myself, paying for myself. And I had a really interesting job when I first graduated, which was I was a, a transcriber for a second floor music. Second floor music is, is Don Sickler's mm -hmm. um, publishing company. And I, I met Don through some sessions while I was at NYU. And um, yeah, I'm, he was impressed with me. Right away, I mean, when I was in high school, I used to play second floor music, you know, combo charts, and uh, I was familiar with that writing. And I think he was impressed with me in the sessions because I was a good reader. I could read the charts right away and, and like, understand, you know, what was happening. And, uh, and then he, he said that he had some, some work just uh, transcribing piano music. I mean, he, he publishes uh, a lot of music a lot of composers from the blue note area he put era he, he, he publishes hank mobley and uh kenny dorham and he's involved in thelonious monk and so what what he what he would do is you know let's say he he's you know he would ask me to transcribe the kenny drew solo on a kenny dorham record you know whistle stop or something uh, and then so i would transcribe it and then uh, he would put it on his website for, for sale. And anyways, I did that for two years. I was just uh, transcribing piles and piles of piano solos uh, and transcribing all sorts of stuff too. piano solos. Or sometimes I would transcribe comping or sometimes I would transcribe uh, a tune that maybe there wasn't a chart for. Um, and it was pretty busy, actually. I, I, I have a, an accordion folder that's like this thick filled with 
all sorts of transcriptions. And that was actually, that, that was my most regular, it still was the most regular employment I've, I've had in New York City. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and I did that for, yeah, about two years. What were the most important things that you learned about the process of transcribing that if you had to relay to someone who most likely isn't going to be transcribing as a job, but is going to want to be transcribing just for their own edification. So what are some important things that you learned during those two years? Well, Don, you know, Don's thing was very much, um, Don's thing was a lot about notation. I, I mean, the, the notes needed to be exactly right. And anything that I transcribed, I needed to be able to play at the piano and, and show this, this is it. And then I needed to learn how to put that exactly on, on paper. Um, and that, that's actually not a skill that everyone needs to, needs to have. Uh, um, it, it's, it's, it suits me. I, I, I like that sort of thing. I, I like reading and I like thinking about the logistics of, of reading. Um, but certainly transcribing does not have to be written down. Um, but I, it's helped me. It's helped me. Uh, have a very specific visual when I'm when I'm playing, and it's helped me. Yeah, I, I think if if you can write down what you're playing, it it can help to organize your improvisations. Uh, it's it's not necessary for everyone, but it 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 helps me a lot. Um, and also, it made me a better reader when when I was doing all these transcriptions. Not only did my, my ear obviously became way better, I, I started to be able to transcribe stuff really quickly and being able to hear the left hand in piano players and being able to hear accents and articulation. That my ears became really really sharp. But then also my my reading became a lot sharper when I was when I was doing this since I had to write everything down. So it did really strengthen a lot of. Mm, fundamental musicianship aspects, you know, for me. Um, yeah, and also a lot of language, obviously. Um, when I was transcribing, also Wynn Kelly and Sonny Clark and Coy Tyner. I mean, I'll, I'll, and it's all over the place. So I, I got a lot of great language as well. But um, yeah, it helped me to, to read better. It helped me to hear better. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it's very helpful. It, it, it's not for everyone. I, 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 it's not explicitly necessary to have to write down a trip. Some people would say it's, it hurts to write it down. I don't think it hurts, but mm. it, there, but there is, but there is, uh, you do have to be really good with the language. There is a language skill that you have to get, get over in order to be able to, and it, it's not important to everyone. And, and uh, yeah. It was helpful for sure. me. Yeah, tell us a little bit about uh, just specifically what your your process is like when you're transcribing something, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you what steps you take in order to figure out what something is when it's not an immediately recognizable piece of of language or, or, or diatonic or, or something or anything along those lines, and and something that might stump your your ears a little bit uh, more than than a lot a lot of just bebop language. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, I mean, honestly, it's guess and check. It's just guess and check. I, I mean, it's the same process from when I was first transcribing from a disc man when I was 15. I would just hit rewind and guess and check until I got exactly what it was. And uh, that's still what it is. I mean, my ears are a lot better now. And I actually, doing all this transcription now, when I listen to a pianist, I have a more specific idea of what they're doing exactly. But in order to get to that point, it's guess and check. And, and, and even still to this day, I hear a lot of things that I don't know right away. Of course. I mean, of course. Uh, and then if I'm going to transcribe that, it's, I just sit down at the piano and hit rewind over and over again until I get it exactly right. And, uh, you know, if I need to use a slow downer, uh, I would, I would do that. But sometimes the slowdowner doesn't really help because sometimes the sound gets distorted and you can't really hear what it is. Or, right. And it certainly certainly doesn't help with the rhythmic thing. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's really just sitting at a piano and hitting rewind until I can 
really get the notes ex exactly right, and I just guess and check. And honestly, sometimes it takes a long time. Sometimes it'll take an, an hour to get three seconds. Sometimes in an hour, you can do a whole solo, and sometimes in an hour, you can only get like four seconds, 10 seconds done. I, I mean, sometimes just hearing one chord can take a really long time. And I don't think that will that will ever go away. I mean, you never get to a point where you just hear everything immediately right away. But 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 you can get pretty close, especially if it's a pianist that you're familiar with and you're familiar with their language and what they tend to do. Yeah, and it, and it probably gets a little bit faster. You know, the more you get to know someone in particular, um, they're, they're playing and their tendencies and that sort of thing. But you're completely right. I think uh, it's it's never going to be just an immediately recognizable thing. You know, just just be able to listen to it once or twice and then just write the whole thing down. Maybe in certain cases you can do that, but maybe yeah, maybe some people can do it. I mean, what what you can do right away is. Uh, you can listen to something once and immediately assimilate the feel of it and and assimilate the the, mel the melodic content and the, the big picture stuff. Uh, you can get big picture stuff right away. But the, the sort of work that I that I was doing was, uh, you know, if you have to put it on paper and publish it for for people to to read, I mean, that there is this micro thing that needs to be exactly right. Um, Actually, in, in a way, it was it was starting to have a negative impact on my playing at, at a point because my thinking was so micro uh, that, you know, I, I've had to sp I'm still spending a lot of time zooming out and getting out of uh, this really micro piano specific way of thinking and, and being able to hear a bigger picture. That's maybe a bad thing about transcribing and writing it down too much is you can lose focus of the big picture. Um I don't think it's inherently bad, but at a point, you, you definitely need to be able to have a bigger vision of what, what's happening. The last big transcription project that I did for hire was I, I had met Jeff Kieser uh, when I was 16, but also I, I met him again working with Don. I, I transcribed some of his stuff and we, we connected and, and around this time he, had, he was putting out a solo piano record called Heart of the Piano which is a really amazing record. Wow. And um, he asked me to transcribe the, the record and he was going to sell the PDFs on his website. And so I, I did it. I, I, you know, I transcribed every track on that, including one that didn't even make it on the record, did it all by hand, note for note. And um, that was the last, after that, I, I really take a break from transcription because uh, even though I, I learned so much in doing that and I was pretty fast at that time, but then it was like, okay, I need to zoom out and, and make music and not be so lost in this micro world. But I know all the time that I spent at that micro level has given me a foundation of musicianship that's it's helping me now. Absolutely. And um, I, I totally agree. It's just uh, something that I hear pretty frequently, which is that as soon as you stop focusing on the on the micro, your playing can really expand and, and, and grow pretty quickly. Um, I remember Andrew Gould telling me kind of a sim similar thing when I when I spoke with him uh, the other day. Uh, just uh, you know, he had, I, I forget who it was that uh, he was in a lesson with, but he just kind of learned to stop trying to play every single chord change and just voice lead every single measure into every single mm -hmm. change into every single change and, and just kind of zoom out as as you're saying. Right. Yeah. There's there's other things. That's an interesting situation for. Um, a jazz student that they really need to contend with because somebody tells you what to play. Here's the chord change. You got to play this. And if you do this, it's good. You know? But then you go out in public and you listen to somebody play and they're doing everything wrong. Maybe they're playing none of the chord changes. Maybe they, maybe they have bad intonation. Maybe everything about it is not what your, what your teacher told you or something, but they're effective. They're playing great. And even though you're in your world doing everything right, what you're doing is not communicating to the audience, but what this person is doing maybe is communicating more effectively, even though it's defying what you thought you were supposed to do. Uh, and you know, coming to terms with that is a, a big shift coming out of music school. It is because what you're supposed to do, you know, what your teacher told you to do is, um, yeah, that's when you're actually playing, that doesn't really matter at all. There's this bigger picture things that start to matter. And once you start addressing those questions, it's it can drive you insane. But also it can be very liberating 
uh, yeah, definitely. And I think, uh, you know, the, the old adage here, uh, comes in handy, which is know the rules so that you can break them. Yeah. And I think that, uh, yeah. it stands true despite mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's uh, it's cliche ness perhaps, mm-hmm. but uh, there's a no, reason. it's completely true. Yeah, yeah. There's a reason just, cliches are cliches. Yeah, I remember reading an interesting. It was an article or, or something where VJ Iyer said, when he's at a live performance, he's listening. He wants to feel like he's in good hands. Uh, and that's an that's an interesting. I think that's a great way of putting it. Like when you're listening to someone, you want to trust that they're not just you want to somehow know that you, you, your time is being used well, and and this is an informed musician who is doing something that is worth your time, you know. Uh, and so when you're playing, you need to somehow communicate to the musicians, you know, that they can trust you. And then you also need to communicate to the audience that they can that they can trust you. And uh, there are elements in your playing that can include, you know, playing the changes and having a certain time feel, you know, those are things that can indicate to the musicians that they are in good hands, but then that doesn't translate to the audience. I mean, the audience never wants to hear someone just playing notes over chord changes, but so so then thinking about that, uh, is a, that's a big out of school question. Although it's never too early to start thinking about it. In fact, everybody should be thinking about that from from day one. Definitely. And so, Around this time when you're working for Second Four Music and doing the transcribing thing, tell us a little bit about the, the type of gigs that you were playing at that time because presumably you were also doing a lot of playing. And uh, one thing that comes up a lot in on the show, but also just in real life, is the, kind of the balance between playing music that you would like to play versus pay, playing music that people will pay you to play. And I think that over time, you know, it's probably safe to say that for, for the majority of people, that balance becomes more favorable towards music that you enjoy and that interests you over time. And so maybe you can just uh, say a few words about uh, what type of, of gigs you were playing at that time, both when you were working at the transcribing job and then also after. Mm-hmm. Well, I was basically saying yes to, to everything, just doing whatever I could and finding a way, because I, I didn't know what I liked or what I didn't like. Um, and I didn't know if what I liked was based on what I was good at and what I didn't like was based on what I wasn't good at. You know, I, I, I wanted to, I wanted to know that my technical skill wasn't informing my, uh, decisions. And, uh, and it, anyways, yeah, I was basically saying yes to everything. And, um, but also I, I didn't end up doing a lot of gigs that I didn't like. I mean, I, as long as, you're, as long as I'm playing jazz music I, or some some form of, so, you know, one one thing I, I I never got involved with like a lot of pop music or wedding bands uh, or that sort of thing. Uh, but honestly, I wouldn't even be good. I wouldn't even be able to. I mean, if somebody asked me to, play, I'm just I just don't have that skill set. So I didn't really have to, to, you know, like for me to play in a wedding band or something right now would be really hard. I mean, I don't I don't have the gear. I don't know the tunes. I I don't know. I'd have to like start. It, it would be really hard. Um, uh, so m- most of the the work that I did was, you know, related to to jazz. I mean, and I was playing, and I was, you know, I was improvising, and the, the spectrum was was pretty vast. I mean, the, the spectrum would be from very straight ahead to very kind of modern, but it was all jazz music, and I, I never really played a lot of music that I didn't like to be honest um and if, if if it was something that i really wouldn't like mm, yeah I, I never really i just i always just kind of played jazz music and that's always what came my way and i never really had to think about that very much that's great i think that that's yeah. is, uh that, that's a gift in a certain sense i mean uh that's great and it turns out that you know, people um, are less likely to to call you or to ask you to do stuff if they if they know that's not your skill set. And so mm. it kind of makes it easier in a sense uh, when you don't have people, you know, asking you to play to play weddings and, and that kind of thing, because you don't have to say no. Yeah, it's true. I, I never really put myself out there that way. 
but it's not i just i just can't i just like i just i'm just not able to i just don't i you know i just i just don't have that skill set i um and it's not a skill set that i ever wanted to really invest in and um i guess fortunately i didn't really have to because i had other work i think as a pianist see, i read this on on uh ethan ethan wrote a blog ethan iverson had a blog post where he said and i've always found this to be true too that if you're a pianist and you can read music and you can write music and like if you're a fluent musician and you play the piano you can always find some work and i actually find that to be true i mean if you're a pianist and you can read music you'll find work somewhere i, I mean that's kind of a good thing about playing the piano and that work worked to my advantage too it would definitely be harder if i was a horn player or, or something um but i i feel like i just, just as a someone who could play the piano and someone who can read all sorts of music, I feel like I could always find work, you know, so, somewhere. That's good for the pianists out there. So if you're in school, you know, you, if you play the piano and you can read music, you'll, you'll, you'll be employed. You'll be at least be as employed as someone who speaks another language. I mean, because that's probably true for any instrument, but piano especially is a pretty employable uh, skill. I think even, even, to this to this day definitely and so one of the things that you've been up to at least in the last few years or maybe a couple years in addition to recording and performing is uh, your youtube channel which uh, in addition to yeah, some videos of performances and other things along those lines uh, you've also been uploading these amazing i guess you might you might call them tutorial videos uh -huh. Although that right. they're, they're so in depth that to call it just a tutorial to me seems mm. seems a little bit lacking because the mm. just the if if you guys haven't haven't checked out uh, some of these videos uh, you have done you know a few different topics now like uh, phrasing voice mm -hmm. leading um, uh, a, a, a bunch of different topics which are mm. crucial to being able to play jazz and so maybe you can just talk a little bit about. Um, uh, what the procedure is like for coming up with a video like that because it, they're very well produced they're mm -hmm. very thorough and uh, they i think that a lot of people uh find them really valuable so maybe you can just say a few words about the the your thought process behind those yeah i've gotten a lot of good feedback uh from about those videos even when i travel around um which is good and the impetus was was basically you know, there's topics that I think about that that I want to know more about and things that really have helped my plan. And, you know, as I make these videos, they solidify the concepts for me. I mean, there's definitely a selfish element of it. Like, uh, you know, I, I want to learn about these things for, for my sake. Um, and also, they're, they're important topics that I think are really under-discussed. I mean, as, especially for the piano. There's a lot of piano specific things that in, in jazz music are, are really not discussed and it, and if they were discussed, they would really help people out. And that's one, one element of, of making these videos. Um, so, you know, and when I make them, I, you know, I write a script and, and, uh, I, I plan the whole thing out and, uh, I, I, you know, I, I envision the examples that I want to, to use and uh, just kind of piece it together. I, I I have a really old MacBook Pro and I do the whole thing in iMovie with an iPhone, but I'm going to get a new computer soon. I only have four gigs of RAM. It's <laughs> agony putting wow. these videos together. It's agony. Uh, and I, I think I'd be better served with some new microphones. And, and uh, so eventually the production quality is going to get a little better. Um, but also I don't want to overdo it. I, I, I just... I don't want to put out too many videos. I just want to, when I feel like I have something substantial, I want to put it out. And yeah, and these are things that have that have uh, just just really helped me, and, and uh, I think they could help a lot of people as, as well. Yeah, man, and it's yeah. it's very very true what they say about teaching because the best one of the best ways anyway to learn something or to at least uh, solidify what you know about it is to teach it to someone else. It is to explain it. And yeah. I think it's also very true that if you cannot explain a concept to someone else in such a way where they can, where they can understand it, then it's likely that you don't even fully understand it or have your thoughts, you know, fully formed. Yeah. It's, it's really difficult, but maybe essential to be able to 
understand complicated questions uh, simply, you know, to, to be able to explain something complicated in a simple way. And um, yeah, that's, I guess, something that I was, that I'm thinking about when you, when you put these videos together. And they're, 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 they're more careful than, I mean, I, I like casual videos too. I like just turning on the camera and riffing about a topic that's interesting to you. But um, uh, I don't know. This I, I I wanted to put something out that was more structured and more more substantial, and something that could could be of interest to anyone at any level. You know, someone you could be a beginner or an experienced professional and extract something from from the videos. Um, so yeah, you know, I've got a few more ideas for some more I want to do. Yeah, I always find them super informative, and you know, anytime I see see them pop up, although they're not too frequent, as you said, uh, I yeah. think like the 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 gap between the, the the previous two was like a year or something like that, and so yeah, I know it's a little. <laughs> but um, I wanted to ask you, uh, what is your process for discovering and assimilating new information? Is it through transcribing? Is it mostly through listening and just thinking about stuff? Is it uh, in, in in books, do you find a lot of uh, resources that way? Um, how do you go about actually assimilating new information? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good question. And generally, it, it takes a long time. Uh, I think when I was, you know, younger, maybe early twenties, or, or and and even younger, um, my my assimilation process was very. Um, it was very micro. I mean, I was just transcribing on a kind of note by note, it's small detail by small detail. You know, it, was, it was very micro, and I would get every detail of, of some piano solo or something, and uh, then I would kind of extract the, the gesture, or, or I would think, okay, this is a like what I, something that I transcribed pretty early on was this to Korea. Uh, my one and only love from now he sings now he sobs and I you know I transcribed it in every note and it was really influential in my whole way of thinking about harmony and the piano and I would think okay here's a G7 chord how come he's playing this on the G7 chord okay how can I use that thought process to play my own stuff on a G7 chord or how can I use that on a B flat 7 chord or how can I you know what I mean they're very very that that sort of process um, it, it takes it takes a long time, and um, it's kind of unpredictable. I can't always predict how certain information is going to come out in my playing. It's not as simple as if I practice something every day for a week, it will come out naturally. Sometimes I'll practice something every day for a month, and I won't really get any better. But then three years later, I'm able to do it, even if I haven't been practicing it. I mean, there are some things that I can do better now um, just because I'm a better pianist and musician, it, even though I don't practice them regularly, I can do it better than when I was 20 and practicing every day. Um, so there's there's a long arc that I can see more clearly now. I mean, things that I practice, I don't intend to see results immediately. Things that I practice are like seeds that you plant, and someday it will come out. Uh, and I just, but I try not to expect exactly when it will come out i just kind of allow it to come out when it when it will right so, so sometimes it takes years sometimes it doesn't and i mean it's it's, it's a little unpredictable yeah um, it's super funny how that works and it, it's it is very unpredictable and yeah um and, it, and it's also funny too how like you're saying you can uh return to a topic you know years later that you haven't practiced specifically for years and you can be still better at it and for me, it just kind of reminds me of something that I, I uh, saw Hal Galper say at some sort of master class or something, which he, he believes, and I think he's, he's probably correct, which is that uh, all progress is universal in a certain mm -hmm. sense. And, uh, and, and so he, he kind of believes that any area in which you make improvement as a musician or as a pianist or whatever your instrument is, is going to, whether you like it or not, almost transfer into all other aspects and so i think that oh, I, yeah. I find that to be true as well oh absolutely it, it it informs the way you uh i don't know everything the way you speak the way you walk the way you 
breathe, the way you see things, the way you hear things. Uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely connected. It, it really practicing the piano is a lot more than just practicing the piano. <laughs> um, it's definitely a lot more than that. <laughs> Absolutely. So, what would you say is your biggest advice for someone who is younger person? You know, maybe in in high school or in their first few years of college. What would, you, what would you say is your biggest advice for someone who wants to do what you're doing, whether it be on piano or another instrument? Wants to do what I'm doing, uh, or wants to do wants to be a jazz musician, or wants to do what Glenn Zaleski is doing. <laughs> someone who wants to uh, be a jazz musician and play the the type of music that you're playing, or at least the uh, type of music that they enjoy playing, uh, whether or not it be exactly the type of, of music that you're playing. Mm -hmm. Well. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, piece of advice. Um, well, hmm. yeah, I don't know why I'm so, st the reason I'm stumped is because there's so many things that I don't, there's so many things that you could say that I don't want to limit it to one little thing. Uh, cause especially if I don't even know specifically who I'm addressing or what level they're at, I mean, some maybe maybe you can just tell us uh, <laughs> tell us a few things that you did in your musical development that you found to be very beneficial to your overall progress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, something that's that has been important to me um, as a jazz musician is uh, is repertoire. And this was actually something that, that my teacher, that, that Dick Ogren, told me when I was 12 or 13, and I, and I went to my, my first lesson with him. And he said, if you want to be a jazz pianist, you have to have repertoire. They basically said, if you want to be a jazz pianist, you have to know tunes. If you don't know tunes, you're not a jazz pianist. But if you know tunes, you are a jazz pianist. Sort of like saying, you don't even have to know it that well you just have to know tunes that you can play with people if you don't know tunes then what are you going to play with people or what are you going to play for people right and it was a very simple thing in a way and it and it makes sense i mean if you want to be a jazz musician a jazz pianist but there's nothing that you can play if all you can do is look at chord changes on a on a piece of paper and play notes over them then you're not really a jazz musician you know i mean that that's that doesn't a lot of people can do that um, but that doesn't really, doesn't really mean anything. That doesn't do anybody any good. That's, uh, it doesn't do anybody. Just, yeah. But, but, it, but you have to know, no tunes. And from a very young age, I, I, I learned a lot of tunes and, and, and the process of learning a tune, uh, listening to different recordings and learning the melody and learning it in different keys and learning different ways to move around the harmony and just amassing a reservoir of, of, tunes and melodic information um that's been really helpful and i've always been ready ever since i i've always been ready to play the piano to, to, to play tunes like if, if if there was a piano in a room i i would always be ready to play tunes or if somebody called me for a gig i, I would always have tunes that i could play uh I was never really concerned about getting a gig, but I was always concerned with what I would play if I had the gig. And then w with that, you know, performance opportunities just kind of came up. Um, but I do think if you, I mean, I don't want to like stir up a whole controversy. I, I don't think it's controversial to say if you want to be a jazz musician, you have to know tunes. You, you, you can be another kind of, you can be, there's all sorts of ways that you can play music. But if, you know, I, I, I'm a jazz musician and if somebody else, wants to be a jazz musician uh they you should learn learn tunes and have something that you can play on your instrument you know ha have something that you can play on your instrument other than just looking at a sheet of looking at an i reel book and improvising notes over those chord changes if all you can do is look at an i reel book and play notes over chord changes you you're going to have a hard time being a professional musician um but if you know tunes and you can play with people especially as a pianist you'll you'll be fine you know and, and then and then the process of learning tunes will inform your whole musicianship 
um, because you say learning tunes, but that's that's kind of a euphemism for a much bigger process. I mean, learning a tune, I think actually this, this is interesting. Like, jazz musicians get together and, and they might say like, yeah, we'll just play tunes. But that's actually kind of a euphemism. I mean, we, we speak about it very lightly, but just playing a tune is a pretty enormous job. I mean, you have to know a lot about your instrument, a lot about interacting with people, a lot. You have to be flexible to just get together with somebody and play, uh, you know, a tune. Uh, it's not really casual. I mean, it takes a, a high level of, of, of expertise. So, uh, yeah, I think if you want to be a jazz musician, have tunes that you know that, that you can play. Don't limit your musicianship to just being able to read a chart that someone puts in front of you, because if that's all you can do, you're, you're, you're going to find it hard to work and you're going to find it hard to interact with people and you're going to find it hard to play for people. You have to have a relationship with music that's more, that, that really is coming from you. You know, if you're a musician, you should be able to go to your instrument and play a tune at any time. You shouldn't need music. You shouldn't need any other musicians. You need to have a very uh, immediate relationship to, to material that you can play. And tunes, jazz tunes are, are a great way to, I mean, the reason people are so, the reason this works is because jazz tunes and jazz standards are such a great vehicle for learning about music and your, and your instrument. It's so potent potent it's so rich um just learning uh just learning embraceable you is a lot more than just learning embraceable you it's the questions that you have to address are a lot more than what's a good voicing for g what's a good voicing for what's a good voicing for b flat diminished i mean it's a lot more than that um yeah and there's a reason why all these tunes are still around and i think it's at least in part because they are uh, for all intents and purposes, inexhaustible resources of of harmonic, melodic information and, and so on and so forth. And so there's a reason why we're still playing them. Yeah, and where you can use this information. Actually, I, I should mention this is because it's on, on these topics, but um, a, a friend of mine who is a, an amazing pianist and, and a, a YouTube, she also makes great YouTube videos. Her name is Nare Sol. And uh, she does these. She does these things. She was actually briefly a student of mine. A student. She wanted to learn about jazz, and uh, um, but uh, she does these videos where she'll take a genre from the perspective of a classical pianist and kind of absorb it. And she recently did one on bebop, and um, it's, I highly recommend the, the video. And it's basically, she goes through and just absorbs a lot of information about bebop about changes and, and rhythm and just kind of foundational stuff and then at the end of it she plays this arrangement of all the things you are that's like you know it's not it's not literally bebop at all but 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 you can hear how that digested information can lead to that it's like just learning the tune all the things you are there's so many things that you can do you can play it like barry harris or you can play it like like Nare, who, who played this crazy arrangement of all the things you are. But, but it's still, when you listen to it, you can hear that it's coming from Bebop, too. It's very, very potent stuff. Uh, and how, yeah, how you can use this information for your own musicianship. And, and it, that's what's so beautiful about it. It's, it's like when it gets filtered through everyone's perspective and personalities, uh, there's just so much to hear. I mean, and, and there's so many possibilities. It's wonderful definitely and yeah. so the the last topic i want to touch here is just uh, your compositional process because as you said in the beginning you know you've always kind of been writing music um presumably since you were you know in your teenage years or, or whenever you whenever you started and so i wanted to ask you about the process uh, do you start with the melody always do you always start with harmony is it are your tunes fueled by some sort of harmonic device what is the uh, is it possible to distill a, a, a process, or is it kind of a, a mixed bag? Oh, it's, it's a mixed bag. Definitely a mixed bag. Um, it often involves me sitting at the piano and improvising, and then stopping when I find the kind of flow that I like and trying to write down some elements of it that, that I liked. 
so it's connected to the to the piano. My my writing is is connected to the piano, definitely. Um, so it often starts there, but then once I start there, I, it, it could be a melody that, that guides the thing. I mean, it could be a, a root movement that, that guides the thing. Uh, it could be all sorts of things. But it does generally start with me sitting at the piano, uh, improvising. Um, but yeah, there's very many there's different directions that it takes all the time. And I, I'm, I'm still learning a lot about that. I, w I would say that as a, I have always been writing since I was a teenager, but I would say that, and I've recorded a lot of original music and, and uh, I've arranged for quintets and quartets and trios and nonets. But I would still say that as a writer, I've, I, I still feel the most, uh, I still have a lot more to do in that, in that, that's still, that's something that I, I feel like I um, have the most, uh, kind of work to do, the most work that I want to do. And I'm still learning a lot about that. When I've been the most productive as a writer, it's, it's when I write every day. It's when I force myself to write every day. Just, just something, just, um, just sitting down at the piano for 30 minutes and forcing myself to put something on paper. And if I, when I do that every day, that's when I have the most luck. Yeah, man. And it's definitely, it's definitely a never ending process. So we're all yeah. looking forward to uh, seeing what you come up with next, both in your uh, recording, your compositions, and also the YouTube channel. And mm -hmm. so uh, are, are you teaching privately right now? Do you have a, a private studio, whether it be in person uh, or over Skype? Yeah, I do teach privately. I, I, I mostly teach out of my apartment here in Brooklyn, um, but I, I occasionally do, do a Skype lesson. And, uh, yeah. Right on. And uh, is your website glenzaleski.com? Is that is that correct? Yeah, that's okay. it. Perfect. Exactly. And uh, for people listening to the audio of this, it's Glenn with two N's, last name Z-A-L-E-S-K-I.com. And people mm -hmm. can, I'm sure, find you on Instagram as well. Is that just Glenn Zaleski as well? No, I think that's Glenn Zaleski 824. Got it. All right. People will search you and, and they'll find you. Um, yeah. so, Hey man, this was awesome. I think we covered a, a ton of topics. This is super enjoyable for me. And I think, um, if, uh, whoever made it to the end of this, I, I'm sure that they, they, they enjoyed it as well, just as much as I did. So thank you so much again for coming on. Yeah. Really happy to, to chat with you. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Uh, stay on the line for uh, one second and, uh, thank you again, Glenn. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for checking out the podcast and don't forget to subscribe wherever you happen to be listening to this and you can always go to berniesbootlegs.com for more episodes. Thanks again and see you guys next time.